Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship of praise and thanksgiving on to Almighty God on this wonderful Eastertide Sabbath, the last of April before we move right into May and the wonder of flowers and hopefully no more snow. But who knows? It's a gift that keeps giving, apparently. Um, a couple of announcements I'd like to draw attention to. One is the mission committee um, really wanted to give a great thank you to the congregation for the one great hour of sharing. Uh, that mission, those monies that we collected for that offering um, goes to a variety of needs um, within communities. Um, and this year, the total was 3318 which had surpassed uh, the last several years of giving for that. So that was really wonderful and remarkable, and so it's with great um, gratitude that we receive all of those. And the other is more uh, moving forward, and that is the Manor is planning its annual Mother's Day plant sale on May 9th from 9 to 11. This is a pre-order sale only, so if you want the flowers, you have to order them early. Now, the nice thing about it is we have the order blanks in the, sim, in the Sims room on the green, um, the table with the green tablecloth. Um, and so the order forms are there, and you can order them and get that in before then, and you will have some wonderful plants. So um, those are great. Uh, are there any, uh, the other announcement I do have is that there will be the Zoom coffee hour and that will be coming um, at around 11.30. And again, it's our virtual coffee hour uh, at this point. Um, are there any other announcements? Nope. Okay, no. Nope. Then let us lift our hearts, lift our minds, lift the totality of our being up to God in prayer. First, with the music of the prelude.
Good morning. I read to you the call to worship, and you join me. In this time of worship and throughout our lives, we call on God in moments when we search for the power to act justly. May we do so in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In situations when our lips long for powerful words to speak, may we do so in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When it is easier to hate and we desperately need the power to love, may we do so in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God offers salvation, transformation, solace and refuge. In it, we obtain the power to act, the power to speak, the power to follow, and the power to love. In all we do and all we say, let us do so in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Um, you join me in hymn 475. We next have Psalm 23, but a little bit about it first. Psalm 23 is much loved and undoubtedly one of the most well-known passages in the Bible. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, the image of God as shepherd inspires trust and confidence, but does not deny the multiple sustained threats to that security. Thus, we should take care that our familiarity with this psalm does not give away to sentimentality. In the psalm's culminating verse, the writer is daily pursued, follow this in the New Revised Standard Version, no longer by enemies, but by God's goodness and steadfast, faithful love. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. 
He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest of valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Now the call to reconciliation. In Christ's resurrection, we are made whole. This is the good news of the Easter season. The love of Christ heals us where we are broken and returns us to God when we stray. As we confess our uncertainties and our unbrokenness, and our brokenness, pardon me, we affirm what Christ offers us. The prayer of reconciliation. Standing before the religious authorities in Jerusalem, Peter cried out, the stone rejected by you, the builders, has become the cornerstone. You're supposed to join me. Place <laughs> love before love. We too confess that we have rejected the stone that is Christ Jesus. In our doubt, we have and turn towards false securities, hopes, and promises. In our ignorance, we have invested in artificial love and cheap grace. In our defiance, we have denied our beliefs and ignored your guidance. We too have rejected the stone in these ways and others. In this silence, we confess our acts of rejection. A moment of silence. Lord, hear our confessions as recognition for wrongs done in the past and hope for transformation to come through your grace. And as the water is poured into the baptismal font, we are reminded that the people of God are assured that even though the stone was rejected, it now sits as a cornerstone, ever-present, ever-forgiving, everlasting. You are forgiven. Stand firm on this foundation, proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ now and forever. Thank you. Please be seated. And now, with those who are nearby you, and those you can turn around and wave to, uh, both here and for those who are watching this through our live streaming, we invite you to greet one another with the peace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, saying, peace be with you, and responding, and also with you. And if those of you who are watching this through our live stream, we invite you, if you're by yourself this morning, to think about those people who you would like to extend the peace of Christ to and to call them, write a note to them, but let them know that you're wishing peace be with them as well. So let us greet one another the peace of our Savior Jesus Christ. Peace be with you.
And so we come to our children's message, and normally in the pre-COVID era, um, we would have children come forward. But because we're in the situation we're in now and have been for over a year, we're just getting back to in-person worship, I'm going to invite the children to stay where they are for now. But I want to say and talk to both to all to those who are here, uh, as well as for those who are watching on the live stream. We talked about, well, how do you're going to hear a lot about shepherds this morning. We're going to hear about Jesus as the good shepherd. We're going to hear a lot about sheep. But the real question is, well, how do shepherds actually take care of sheep? Um, and I've driven through Scotland and I've driven through Ireland and watched how they keep their sheep. Um, I have when I was serving one of my first churches, I had a gentleman who had come, to, come from Italy. And when he lived in Italy as a boy, he had been a shepherd. And so we talked a little bit about shepherds and sheep. And he said, sheep and shepherds think of themselves as a family. And the shepherd can tell when one of the sheep really isn't feeling well, can tell when the sheep is feeling great, uh, and is also watchful to make sure that they have enough food to eat, they aren't, don't get lost, because sheep kind of do that a bit. Um, and he also said that the sheep can tell when the shepherd is leading them out to pasture, calling them home with a song that they might make, know when they're being fed by the sound of the voice of the shepherd. And so they have a real close connection. And so I want you to listen today through when we talk about all the other things about sheep and shepherds. I want you to think about that and think about how is that like our families that we take care of one another that way. We pay attention to each other's voices. We kind of know when someone's not feeling well. We kind of know when someone really is hungry and wants something to eat. And so kind of keep in mind that when you listen to all of that we're going to be hearing this morning about sheep and shepherds on this Good Shepherd Sunday. And we're going to close with a prayer that we've been doing, and I invite you to repeat the words after me that I will say. And I will do it slowly enough for us to do that, okay? So let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to show your love every day. with kind words, helping hands, and smiling faces. Amen. Our next reading comes from, oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. And come back. We'll get used to this. Um, so our next reading is Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. These opening four verses of the chapter set the scene for, for this, in which the prisoners, Peter and John, have been arrested, and they've been held in custody by temple officials as a result of their teaching and preaching about the resurrection. In the face of questioning, Peter responds at first with an implicit censure of his interrogators. How is it that a good deed has become bad? In their fixation on a perceived challenge to the established authority and doctrine, these religious leaders are unable to see the miracle that has taken place in their midst. And so we hear then these words from Acts chapter 5, verse tw verses 5 through 12. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Ananias, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, 
and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom was crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by among mortals by which, by which we must be saved. Uh, it's from John 3, 1 John 3, 16 through 24, uh, and a little bit about it. The command of 1 John 3, 16, 24 is clear. Love one another. Love sacrifices. Love attends to the economic realities of our siblings. Love moves boldly. Love shows obedience to God's way. This multi-layered love for one another has God's love as its source and its model. Its essence, however, is to be expressed outwardly in word, in deed, in action. Love is a verb. And now from John. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help. Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in others, in us, by the spirit that he has given us. And now we'll have uh, hymn 486.
And our final reading for today is the New Testament reading. It is, comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. And so hear a little bit about the context of this reading. In a similar way to Psalm 23, John 10, 11 through 18 is a passage whose familiar comforting message exists in some tension with its context. Echoing Peter's experience in Acts 3 to 4, John 9 to 10 recounts Jesus' healing of a blind man followed by a contentious discussion with religious leaders in which Jesus employs metaphors of sheep and sheep tending in an attempt to reveal himself to the entrenched leaders. A good shepherd's love for the sheep bears the same qualities as those described in the 1 John 3 reading, sacrificial, bold, power-filled. And furthermore, this shepherd is not the shepherd only of these sheep. One flock, one shepherd. Other sheep, ultimately all sheep, will belong to this shepherd. And so we hear this. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This ends our reading of God's word on this day. Thanks be to God. Those lines, which we read and sometimes memorize at the beginning of our lives, travel with us all our days, Fred Rogers wrote to his friend, journalist Tim Madigan. Madigan was compiling a book of the favorite poems of celebrities when Fred wrote to him following, the following. All to thine own self be true, and it must follow as night the day. Thou cannot be false to any man. And so I must admit, there is a favorite poem from every poet I have ever loved. But to choose one favorite, I find myself going even further back in my life to a psalm by King David, which my parents recited to me many, many times when I was very, very young. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. Fred Rogers' parents had prayed that psalm every day, and Fred had learned it from their daily reciting of it. And as he grew up, he spent time reading it and studying it in a variety of languages and countless scholarly commentaries. He repeated it every day. He could still hear his mother and father's voices saying that psalm. In 1970, Fred visited his father, who was very ill, just before leaving for a two-day work trip. And they spoke about many things, including his father's beloved evergreens. And before he left, Fred said, we just naturally said the 23rd Psalm together. And the next day, while I was away, Dad died, Fred said. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever are the last words we spoke to each other in this life of all the poems or writings that might have molded and shaped Fred Rogers' life, Psalm 23 was the one that really did shape his life 
because it was with him every day of his life and because it bound him to his parents. It spoke to him like nothing else could have and it created with him the reality he lived every day of his life, a reality centered upon God and God's love for the world. As the beloved host of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, he explained his way of doing television this way. The whole idea is to look at the television camera and present as much love as you possibly could to a person who needs it. I imagine that Fred Rogers also heard and recognized the voice of the Good Shepherd in the words of the psalm and made a choice to follow Jesus just the way Jesus told the crowd his followers would. The shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Jesus knows that the only way for his followers to do what he has called them to do, to teach what he was teaching and be empowered to do all the things he commissioned them to do after he was no longer physically in the five senses meaning of that particular word, when he was no longer physically with them, was for them to hear his voice, recognize his voice, remember the path Christ is leading them to journey along and stay on that path. Jesus knew this was true because he knew his followers were surrounded by the noise of competing voices whether it was the noise of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, or the Zealots saying, our way is the best way, or whether it was the noise of Greek philosophers proclaiming the Epicurean way, the Stoic way, the Platonic way, the Socratic way, the mystery religion way, all saying, you must like us the best, or whether it was the noise of Herod and Tippus and the Roman emperors saying, no, this is the way the world works. The key for the apostles to be like Christ and stay on his path is to hear and recognize his voice. This is the reason Jesus uses the shepherd sheep metaphor that comes from the daily lives of people living in largely rural communities and from the long tradition of shepherds and sheep in the Psalms, particularly Psalm 23. Now, I know being called a sheep seems, well, pretty insulting because, after all, and there really is no polite way to say this, sheep are notoriously dumb. They're passive, they won't, and they can't defend themselves against predators, and they're prone to get lost. But I do think they are kind of smart in a way because sheep know they can't go it alone. And they know they need someone to lead and guide them. And they prefer being led. Sheep will only follow their shepherd because his voice is the one they know and recognize because shepherd and sheep have an intimate family relationship. Sheep, it seems, consider the shepherds as part of their family. And they develop and share a language of their own. And the shepherd can tell the difference between a bleat of pain and a bleat of pleasure, while the sheep learn the click of a tongue that means food and the two-note song signaling, it's time to go home. And the tone of comfort in the shepherd's voice that assures the sheep, the shepherd is looking out for them, for their well-being and their life. And they trust the shepherd will never abandon them and will always keep them safe. And the same is true for the apostles. Their relationship with Jesus over the three years, and more importantly, during the 40 days following his resurrection, grows and deepens. The apostles learn what his voice sounds like and what his words mean. They develop a language that has its roots in the language they already share as Judeans, though Jesus deepens their understanding of the nuances of this language by all that he teaches and commands them, so that when they are sent out to, into the world to teach all that Jesus taught them on the day of Pentecost, they will still be able to hear his voice, 
recognize his voice and keep to the path he calls them to journey along throughout their lives, even as they invite others to join them on their journey by becoming the sheep in Christ's flock. And the challenge we face as followers and ambassadors for Christ today is how will we hear and recognize Jesus' voice? How will our children hear and recognize the voice of the Good Shepherd? After all, we are caught in a complex matrix of change termed postmodernity that is, as Craig Detweiler and Barry Taylor explain it, postmodernity doesn't mean a mere adjustment of modernity. It is a quantum leap into a new world of ideas, values, and ethics. All of Western society has been impacted by it, and nothing is really the same. Rationalism, faith in the future, and many of the ideas that fueled modern Western life have been discarded or at least reinvented. And within this complex matrix of change, we are surrounded by the noise of radio, television, newspapers, magazine, the internet, where people tell us this is the way the world works, or no, this is the way the world works. Oh, no, no, if you want to know the way the world works, come over here, particularly all those Instagram influencers and YouTube influencers out there. We are inundated by the noise of people telling us the way to be the church is through flashy MTV, reality TV technology and worship, or the way to be church is through a slick business-like marketing campaign to those niche markets we want to reach. But Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And that, that is really the key. It is hearing and recognizing Jesus' voice after more than three decades of study and reflection. The way I believe we will be able to do this is like being like Christ. When Jesus struggled in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, he was discerning voices and making choices. And as Professor Luther Smith said during his seminary retreat, was Jesus out there all alone? And after a pause, he answered himself, no, Jesus was not alone. The faithful temple teachers who had taught him the scriptures he knew by heart, they were there with him along with God. And of course, Jesus could resist the tempter because he knew the scriptures that had made, they had made him learn by heart the very ones that had sustained him in his time of trial. He shall command his angels concerning you so that you do not stumble and fall. And this is how we learn to do what the Bible says, and that is make faithful choices. Christians are formed and shaped by the biblical narrative. A congregation is a Christian, is Christian, to the degree that it is confronted by and attempts to form its life in response to the word of God, insists William Willimon. Willimon emphasizes that Christians are a people formed by the word of God made flesh in Jesus Christ and by the word of God, which is scripture. The Bible is a reality defining narrative that stands against all other competing narratives for understanding not only how the world was put together, but also how it works and how people are to live together in community. And this reality is defined each Sunday when we journey from our homes and gather together in this sanctuary, or when we are joining on Facebook Live through live streaming, and we are together in this sanctuary to hear once more the biblical narrative read and proclaimed to the whole of liturgy, and particularly in the waters of baptism and the celebration of the Eucharist, where we are called to remember God's mighty acts of salvation by reliving God's saving act of grace in Jesus Christ's death on a cross and his resurrection to new life. It is in scripture that we hear God's voice speaking life into being teaching the man and woman to trust God, 
promising a covenant of life with all of creation, whose symbol is a rainbow, calling Abraham and Sarah into a relationship with God that promises abundant life and blessing, not only for Abraham and Sarah and their children, but for all humanity and creation, demanding the liberation of God's people. We also hear in scripture, bringing them out of slavery and leading them then through a wilderness where God speaks into being a new way of living as a distinctive community who trusts God with their lives. It is in scripture where we hear God calling prophets to speak words of repentance, of promise, of new life, of hope. In scripture, we hear God's promise of healing, of abundant life, of justice, salvation, of hope in the voice of Jesus, whom God sends not to condemn us. And this is good to hang on to, by the way. God sends Jesus not to condemn us, but to save us by a cross and resurrection. It is in scripture we learn that Christ's voice is the voice speaking self-giving love that is patient, that is kind, that seeks our well-being, calling us to follow him by being obedient to God just as Jesus is obedient and to live as Christ did, God's way of being in the world that promises an abundant life of joy and peace. It is in scripture where the apostle Paul reminds us Christ calls us not to be conformed to the world or to the world around us but to participate in God's transforming of the world around us. We are a storied people says Stanley Hauerwas because the God that sustains us is a storied God. And when we learn God's story, the story of God's people throughout time and place, we too discover our own life story is included in it. And then we are part of a timeless and expansive community of Christ that is simultaneously local and global, a community that by its very life together, every single day proclaims, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen.
And now I get to do one of the best things I get to do. And I don't get to do it very often as an interim pastor, I must say. Um, so this is like wonderful for me, as it is, I think, for everyone. Uh, but it is wonderful to be able to baptize a child uh, and to reinforce and reclaim God's grace that comes to us just as a gift that we receive. And we do that today. So if you want to come up, Jessica, Andrew, they could come up if you want, if they would like to stand here too. Nothing bad will happen to you. You can come closer. It's okay. It's only water. Trust me. Okay. And I'm going to do this. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ from Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And you commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Hear also these words from Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. The promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away everyone whom the Lord our God calls. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. And as we celebrate baptism on this day, may we all remember with joy our own baptism. On behalf of the session, I present Elena Rose Peace, Peace the daughter of Andrew and Jessica, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Jessica and Andrew, as there always is, because we're Presbyterians after all, there are questions. <laughs> Jessica and Andrew, do you desire for Elena to be baptized? If so, answer yes. yes. Andrew and Jessica, relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your children? If so, answer yes. yes. And now, because this is not one of those things where it's only you know, the family that makes commitments. The congregation also has to make a commitment to this child as well and to this family. And so here's the question I put to all of you. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Elena and support Andrew and Jessica by word and deed, with love and prayer, encourage them, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of Christ's Church? If so, answer yes. 
Through baptism, we enter the covenant God has established. And within this covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. Embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning to Jesus Christ. As God embraces you within the covenant, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. And here are the questions for y'all. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, answer, I do. Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, answer, I will, with God's help. I will, with God's help. And now I invite you all who are able to please stand and say with us the Apostles' Creed. And we'll say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And now I invite you as we pray over this water to give thanks for it and for all that it means for us. Please join me in prayer. We give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. In the beginning of time, the Spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. You led Israel out of slavery to the waters of the sea, into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We thank you, O oh God, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. From it, we are raised to share in his resurrection. And through it, we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Send your spirit to move over this water that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Raise Elena Rose to new life and graft her to the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on her that she may have the power to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, be all praise and honor and glory now and forever. Amen. To nine grandchildren, it doesn't get old. <laughs> Elena Rose, I baptize you in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, <laughs> and the Son. I feel the same way. And the name of the Holy Spirit. And let's pray. If we can do this. Let's pray. O Lord, uphold Elena by your Holy Spirit. Give her the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the awe of the Lord, and the spirit of joy in your presence both now and forever. Elena, you are a child of God. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Now, there is that, and you know why that's there? You can take that with you. 
And that is a stone that is for you to keep and to hold someplace safe. And when she grows up, and you can understand a little bit, that stone is to remind you to tell her about the day when she was baptized. So that she has a memory out of it from the memories that you store that you tell her of that day. Can you do that? So you got a whole pot stuff there in your pocket? Or you're not going to There you go. Yep. All right. That's how that works. And now we open our lives up to God and lift our prayers to God in some other ways. And so I invite you now to be in prayer as well. Pray with me. Good Shepherd, there are many among us today and throughout the world who are walking through the deepest of valleys. For those who are physically and mentally ill, those who feel lonely and isolated, for those whose poor choices and behavior had limited their futures, and those who are victims of others' poor choices and behaviors, and for those entering into their final days. For all of these and more, we pray that they may know they are cherished members of your flocks. May they rest in green pastures in the tranquility of still waters, May they receive offerings of comfort and protection, be welcomed at the table of plenty, and blessings overflow to them. We lift their needs to you, our protector and caregiver, in silence in this moment. And especially we continue our prayers for Suzanne Rutan and the family and her family and the passing of her mother, for Bruce and Marjorie, for Mary and Tim and Barbara and Ron and, Ro and Carol and Rowena and Bob and Kim, for Josephine and for Phyllis. And gracious God, we leave these prayers with you because we know that you hear them and will act upon them as you discern as best for all peoples, praying together as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us bring to God the offering of our life and our labor. Uh, the way we have been doing it, obviously, is that those who wish to can leave their offerings in the plates by the door. You can also go old school by mailing, using the post office, a check into the church office and That'll be received as well. We also have online giving, which we encourage folks to use and do. Um, however you choose to bring us your offerings, please know that we are grateful for them, for they help us to do the ministry that, and mission in this community and among this congregation that you all want to do. And so we are grateful for that, and we hear now the offertory and doxology.
Go out into the world to live and love as Christ did, being Christ to all who you meet and encounter this week. And may the God who created life in the beginning be above you and below you. And may God, the word of life, be at your right hand and your left hand. And may God, the breath of life, be within you and surround you on this day and all days, now and forever. Alleluia. Amen. And now let us sit together and listen for the postlude. 